According to the AIA, American Institute of Architects, first and foremost, construction documents are a vital, creative, and even exquisite instrument of communication. In combination of written and graphic formats, construction documents translate the design of the project from the realm of ideas to physical form. The contributions of a myriad of consultants are assembled into a coherent, artful whole. All right, here we go. It's going to be a fun one. So for construction documents, we're going to go through page by page and make sure everything is okay. Most likely, you're just going to have job site and yourself as the architect. For the site location maps, I recommend using something like snazzymaps.com. You can go and take basically a Google map and it puts a filter on it. It makes it look really nice. Or you can just go and take a screenshot, Google maps, whatever, and you can just drop that in. The site and building data, I went ahead and just punched in things specific to this project. You can go and look up climate zone maps. And so, for example, I was able to find that here on the International Code Council, Chicago, it's right here. And so that lands us in zone 5A, cool, humid. If it's difficult to read this black and white map with a black and white legend, uh, something that is also helpful is you can go through by the states in the United States here, and then you can go and find under Illinois, you'd find uh, the county. And then there's some Chicago construction codes, and there's a link to all of them on their website. Zoning district, Navy Pier was zoned plan development, PD. 527. There's our Ferris wheel. You can get some uh, zoning information by just looking into your, your site location. And usually there's some sort of document out there relating to the, the town, the city, the municipality that will help illustrate that for you. We're doing a heavy timber mill construction building, A3 classification, occupable area. We're doing in this project. We're trying to keep it really small. So like about 15,000 square feet is what I have at the time of this recording, then you would have to do your load calculations, which you would do for like your life safety plan, figure out what your total load is coming out of the building, number of exits, but this summarizes it. What's nice about having this on the cover page is it's easier for code review. Right at the forefront, we can see what's being considered. All right, so if I wanted to bring in like these abbreviations, which are made from a, uh, a legend with some text blocks, I could just go and drag that in and then kind of squeeze things around to make room for them. Sometimes on a smaller project, you would just fit all this in on the cover rather than having a separate page for code and all that. What you see here is a construction document checklist adapted and modified from a text called A Manual of Construction Documentation by Glennie Wiggins. And essentially what it is, is a summary of what you should have on each type of construction document. It's broken down phase by phase, so you can manage your time accordingly. Think of each phase as happening simultaneous with the other document of the same phase. It really just allows you to manage your time, pay attention to the details, adhere to standards, and uh, I think it's a useful guide. It's available for download if you'd like from my website, studiohero.co. And I'm going to put this on my other monitor right now, so that way I can use it as I develop the rest of this video. Okay, so for the site plan, Phase one, you draw the building's perimeter. Now, I've developed it further since then, but you could draw the building and just show it in the site plan as just a very basic outline of the building. But now I have just like a real simple outline of my building if I think the other building was too distracting. In other words, you can kind of half tone or gray out the rest of it. Either way would be fine. I think I'm going to leave it like this, though. I think this reads a little bit better. Now, this zoning analysis that I have up here in this uh, template. If you don't want to use it, you can just go ahead and delete it out. But otherwise, you can repeat some of the information from the cover page up here. And then this allows us just to focus on the setbacks and property lines that would be required for our project. So if you know all those things, go ahead and fill that out. For this project, since it's on Navy Pier, it, uh, it's not so clearly defined. So the property and setback lines that I did draw here are a little more random on just the space I want to take up. And I just made some assumptions to do the property line. What I like to do is go to massing and site and use the property lines that are there and then create by sketching. You can go and sketch, you know, if you're given a property line, like area, like the actual property, then you can go and sketch that accurately. For example, like an R3 residential area, 
you know, certain municipality, they'll tell you specifically what they want for the setback lines off the property lines. To do the uh, setbacks, what I would do is go to annotate and I would do detail line and I would choose a detail line that's a hidden line and I would do pick lines and then in the offset, that's where I would be typing in what you want your setback to be. Then I would pick the property line and I would set it back. Now, the other things that you should draw would be any paved areas. It's actually a little bit easier to draw the inverse of that because all of this is paved. So what I did is I drew like the planter box areas slash like green space. And I did that with a filled region. Choose earth. And if you don't have that, you have to make it in this template. I already have it made. And I can go into a spline. Just make sure it's a closed loop. So if I did a spline like right here. And a little trick, sometimes if it won't close, snap to the ends, but just using a short line segment and turning off the lines, it's a huge help. And then turn that back on. And then adjust the graphic scale as needed. So shows like this, you go to edit type, duplicate, call it the name of the scale that you want. So mine was a one foot, or I'm sorry, one inch equals 20 feet. And X represents what one inch is. And so you would just type in then what that f value is for X. So in my case, uh, I had already made that 120. And then the north arrow, you can adjust the angle. Okay. And if you don't have a uh, parametric one like this where you can type in your angle, you can always just use the rotate command. Then drawing the any parking spaces or anything like that, you should draw in. I remember with parking, you would have a 15 foot radius on curbs. So if the car is turning, now a car, when it turns, can turn safely without potentially clipping a sharp corner. So just remember that for your parking lots. Draw in all your parking spaces by going to massing and sites. And you can do parking components on the topography or going to architecture component. You can find parking spaces, you can load them in as components and then you can go and place them. When you go to place them, you can't spacebar to rotate them. You can also take it, give it like a 15 degree angle, and then you can go and array them all the way down. Let's go and throw on some dimensions. So if we go to annotate, go to align. Now, before I do that, I want to double click into the view so the view is active, not the paper. Then we can go to annotate, aligned, and we'll start creating a chain of dimensions. So I'm going to go from here to the property line, maybe the setback, the other property line, the other setback. Maybe I'm also interested in the edge here. And then maybe I'm also interested in how wide this boardwalk is but here since i can't get the endpoint it's cropped out i'm going to just go close click off and escape a couple times then we're going to do a little trick we're going to go to detail line and choose invisible then we're going to go and reference uh, this line right here then we can go here add a line and we can snap to that spot and i'm going to do one more chain going the other way from the property to the setback. And then we could even go to the building or to a column line of the building. So we have some idea of where grid one and grid A are located off the property. We can also spot label based on uh, our project where everything lands. Now here you see that this is, I have a label at 15 because 15 feet up is where our project actually starts. I'm struggling a little bit with that because if I go to my elevations, here you'll see my, I have my first floor noted at zero. All right, so I found a good illustration on what I'm talking about with how it steps up. So here's like Michigan. Here's the boardwalk. Here are the stairs that I drew. Here's where it's elevated. And this tent structure is where our building's going. So we have this road access from the one side, pedestrian access from the other side. So all that's marked out. This pedestrian walk is about three feet up from the water, from what I was able to tell from Google Earth. Watch the pre-design video if you want to see how to do that. And then about 12 feet up from there is this walkway. So in order to do this, 
here without having to do the 3D model. We have to sort of hack it in a way. What I've done in this view is I created just a, uh, a detail by going to annotate the region, filled region, and I just created a solid black color. Go to circle. You can go and draw out a circle of about two feet and just split it into a quadrant. TR to trim. And then once you have that, you can go and mirror it with the pencil and do a 45 degree mirror. And that, then you can go and highlight both and say, make it a group. And when you make it a group, then you end up with that. And then you just throw text right next to it, move them together in pairs. All right. So I'm going to go and just say, this is going to be at a negative 15 feet relative to my project. This one's going to be at a negative 12 feet. And then I can just describe my project at an elevation of zero. Noting any other key features is important. Uh, adding any symbol legends or anything like that. So let's, let's say I had like some fire hydrants or whatever. I want to throw down some legends over here that then indicates any symbology I'm using and what that means right next to the drawing. I indicated road access. I indicated that there's a ramp here. Mark that centennial wheel is within this region here. So what I probably want to do here is just mark like that this is green space. So I'm going to go to text. I'll just describe this as green space. Okay, so before annotating anything, make sure you're in the view. And then let's go and annotate some of the materiality. So I'm going to go to text. Drop in a little uh, text right here. Green space. And then I'm going to do another one for the concrete uh, paver patio or decking. And then usually when it's like a whole surface that you're referring to, it looks nice to do it like this. That kind of shows that you're talking about the whole surface there. But this would be where you could start to describe how some of the things are made. In, on the site. So I could do a section through the, the raised concrete decking and I could do a section through the boardwalk, right? To help illustrate what those items um, are composed of. What I could do is kind of mimic a little bit of what I'm sort of thinking here. So this is another way you could just show your materiality or you could just do it with text. And even here, you can go to ungroup, ungroup, and then edit boundary. If you want to make it look like it's almost you know, broken or whatever. For the wood decking, show the pattern that we want it to be specifically or that could be shown in like more of a detail but basically and we can go to view if we need to create any additional things through here we can just do a section right through different areas and on the section itself you can uh, get a call out a detail right, in different areas of the project if we wanted to. In this video, I'm not going to actually do any details of the site elements, but that's how you would go and do that. So moving into floor plans, here I'm going to go to my floor plan under the 01 arc folder. The reason I'm using these ones under this folder is I have a template, view template for the floor plan applied to those already. So go to floor one. Some different site markers here that I don't need. I'm going to show the crop box and I'm going to go and crop up this view or adjust the north arrow and graphic scale as needed. So here I'm at quarter inch equals a foot. So if I go and drag this view onto my sheet for level one, like this, it does not fit. So then I need to do is change the scale properties on that to be smaller. Higher on the list is bigger. Lower on the list is smaller. So let's try eighth. Drop in. Now you have room for material legend or any other information you might want to show 
alongside this. So that is one eighth inch equals a foot in this case. So I'm going to click on my view scale, choose one eighth inch. My marker rotation straight up, north is up. And what else do we have to have? Phase two would be create cross reference views. So that would be my section lines and all that good stuff. Oh, my sections aren't being shown at this level of detail. So if you see your section lines go away, um, sometimes the scale, the smaller it is, it, it won't show your sections. We go here and just for a moment, change it back to that 3 sixteenths, uh, change it back to a quarter. If we go and pick those, hide scales coarser than quarter inch. So this is where we would say, hide it if it's coarser than an eighth inch. And then now when we go to the actual drawing itself, change it to an eighth inch, we'll still see our section lines on there. Cross-reference views, sections, walls, and large plans. So here we need to create an enlarged plan for us. So I double clicked into the view. I'm going to be going to view call out. This is where you can zero in on anything else that you'd like to dimension out. So maybe I'm going to do it of the office. What else? Overall lengths, chain dimensions, columns. So I'll go to annotate, aligned. And this is where I can start to dimension out some of the key things here. So usually go from the outside edge of a wall, the outside of the outside walls. All right, so your overall dimensions go on the outside. You bring them in towards the inside of the drawing as you get more detailed. I'm going to do the same thing here on the other side, but here I'm going to not get ahead of myself. I'm going to start with the outside to outside first. So I would just go through and here's where I could, you know, dimension out anything else that I need, but this at least gets me my main walls. Now, I need to know like normally where all the exterior walls jog, columns, those usually land on the column line centers. So it's all good. Interior walls usually go center to center. So it's kind of easy to, to memorize because you got your exterior walls go to the outside face. Your interior walls, you're going like center line to center line typically, or you dimension to the face of the framing member, up to you. And I'm going to go and keep adding in more aligned dimensions here to just kind of fix this thing up going this way now. So we can go pretty crazy with this or we can call it good. So we're going to call this good. So next would be tag rooms. So I'm going to go to annotate. Now I could tag rooms with just text or we could actually go through and create room tags. And so to do that, we actually have to define boundaries for rooms and go and tag the rooms. Um, I, I don't like doing that unless I know my rooms are pretty much staying. Uh, if walls adjust or whatever, it kind of messes things up. But since we're at this point, we're good to go. Otherwise, you can just go and throw down some text for each room. We can just go and say like bathroom. And go and underline it. Bold it. Right, we could go like this for our tags, or under architecture, we could go to do rooms. Here we could just start dropping in all of our rooms, right? Now, if this isn't supposed to be one space, what you might want to do is use a room separator first. So let's say this is supposed to be the, the lobby area. You can go and draw that in. 
You can go and tag your rooms. So I got my lobby. Spelling is important because uh, we can reference this on a schedule later. If we misspell things or they're inconsistent. It can mess with the actual uh, schedule. So I would go and do this for each floor. And then from here, what's kind of cool is you can go to create a graphic legend, but it's not under legends actually. Annotate color fill legends. And that automatically applied a uh, color scheme by name to this view because we said that's what we wanted here. So that's kind of cool. And that will help with the labeling. Uh, if you wanted to hide all the labels, you could and just keep it all on the legend. So we could say, you know, select Ansys, uh visible in view. So that's all the names. And then right click hide in view elements. Let's see what else. Um, we could also be duplicating this view and just showing our room tags and all that in that view with the color legend and having all the dimensions. This is pretty comprehensive on this one. Everything's compiled into one graphic. We realize you could be doing multiple views, layering your information separately into each view. That's another way to manage your drawing. Windows and door tag. So we go to annotate. We can tag by category. And we can say, okay, tag these doors. Here you see there's a question mark here, right? So it's not sure what to identify this door as. Here, let's say this one, for example, it says 249. So if I click on this, 249 is the identity mark on this particular door, right? So I can say this exact door. And on a schedule, say this exact door goes to this spot. So here, when I click on this, so there's no mark. So here I can just call it like A if I want. And that could be my, my entrance. So here's a, a great way to save some time, but it will require more manual review to make sure there's no errors. You can say tag all. You can say, give me all the objects in the current view. Give me all the door tags. Give me all the window tags. And we can just say apply and okay. So now the rest of the doors are tagged. Looks like I did a really nice job here. Cleaning those up nicely and got the elevator. Door, so that's good. We need anything else. General notes, symbols, legends. So you just want to think about do I want to throw any other notes on here? Do I need any other symbols? And if you don't, then you're good. So I'm calling this good. So we'll save it and we'll move on to the roof plan. All right, so we're dropping in the roof plan. Now realize that when we're creating the roof plan, we're going to want to create all the floor plans and then move into roof plan. For the sake of time, for the sake of this video, everything I did for floor one plan, you'll just be repeating for floor two, floor three. So here for the roof plan, I had copied the site plan and I made sure that my screening here on top, uh, I went right clicked, override graphics in view by elements, and I overrode the projection lines here as dashed, half toned it, and then we could even up the transparency on this a little bit to apply and okay. So in that way, we understand that there's some kind of screening going on here. The other thing I probably don't need in this roof plan here would be these patio items. So I'm gonna right click and say hide and view elements just to make this even simpler. I wanna picture the contractor that's going to install this roof. You know, what do they need to see? And any of the other elements might be just too much, some overkill, especially if the patio slabs are coming in after the construction. That would be even more distracting because it's something on the drawing that at their phase they're not dealing with. So why have it there in the way? Or I could half tone that and make it real faint so that way it shows that it's not essential to what they're doing. So let's go and dimension this thing up. So aligned.
All right, so let's go and throw in some spot elevations here. So we need to identify, right? You can see how this is the low point. This is where our drain is going to be. And this is the high point. Do I have a drain in here? There we go. All right, so we have that. Type the slope and the pitch. Yeah, so this, you know, has a radius to it. So I think I might mark that from an elevation view. I'll have to just note it. So what I initially had before this was I had uh, every line sloping. And then I had a lot of like flat, low spots. So if I go to edit footprint, this is what the sketch looks like now. So there's no slope on these elements. And then there is a slope on these ones. And that combined then creates the a good, a good roof pitch. So then from here, I'm just going to go and annotate that out as I was. Spot elevations. I need to draw lines here to represent all this. Detail line, hidden line, pick lines, pick this ridge. Now it's kind of easy because then I can just snap to it by doing detail line. There we go. And then my floor drain is going to be right in here. I'm just going to copy it from over here. And right, now this roof's edge. I might want to outline that with just a bolder line for detail. Detail line, wide line. Oh, we got to turn off thin lines. I'm just going to hide that temporarily again. If I do this, divide parts. And then this allows me to kind of create a breakaway look to the roof. So then that way it's easier to show all the detail on the roofing plan. And since it steps down again, I have hidden lines here representing the rest of this roof here on the low end underneath this larger roof right here. Air conditioning unit, just like that. That's the roof plan. Go and save it. If there was anything other that we needed to show on, like additional dimensions or any section cuts or general notes or symbols, we have room to throw that on. And I also need to just hide. There we go, the crop box. This one's done. And we'll move to Reflected Ceiling Plan, RCP. Now, in my design development, I had thrown in a bunch of light fixtures uh, throughout this with just uh, twin motion. So I didn't actually incorporate them into the model yet. So this would be the point in time which I'd want to do that. And I also want to illustrate that, you know, this ceiling that we're seeing <clears throat> is basically the underside of the floor above which is fine. So these lights right now are hosted by this plane. Sometimes lights you put in Revit need to be hosted by a ceiling itself. And a way you can get around that is just make like a, a ceiling made out of air and then you could host items on top of that. Or we can make the ceiling just a thin layer of wood and make that part of the composition of the uh, floor above. Regardless, let's say there's like a drop ceiling in the bathroom or so whatever. We can still put that in. So to do that, architecture, ceiling, here's our 
by base type up gypsum if I wanted to do it two by two system I could do that I could just drop those in these spaces here so we could show that we have two different types of ceilings there and then any light fixtures or anything else we want to throw in since I did my lights in twin motion here uh, doing a like a 2d symbol it's probably the best way to go about the lights if I'm not actually making a 3d model of them turn to the annotate tab I can just create on a detail line my own fixtures and create uh, some sort of like legend for them. So if I go here, let's just do a rectangle. Something like that, but maybe I'd rather do it as a region. And I want to match the detail here, so I'm just going to do pick lines on that. And then copy. And then these light fixtures, whatever we want, right? We can go and throw those in. Same thing, these bathrooms, maybe there need to be more lights drawn in there. We can go and throw in a bunch of can lights. So in this case, we can do that with component. And sometimes when you're doing, uh, when you're doing this, it's nice to underlay what's going on below. So I don't want to put like spotlights on the toilets. So let's go and uh, underlay a little bit of info here. Underlay. Okay. Oops. It doesn't look. Ah, that's why. I think I'll do something like this. So now with this here, I'm going to uh, get rid of underlay. And hide these. We would need exit signs. We need our HVAC, you know, supply, uh, returns. We can draw all of those in. We would like to, or here, we can keep this just as like an electrical plan or a lighting plan as well for the ceiling. Um, but essentially what we want to do here is draw how the finished ceiling is supposed to look. Get this into our sheet real quick. So for the rest of the ceiling plan, I'm just going to go through and annotate a few more things. all the additional items on your ceiling plan, whether it's with detail lines or actual components, just be considering how that's going to affect your 3D model throughout. So if you did something in twin motion that you don't want to show in Revit in 3D, just go use detail line. It's fine. Or any of those components that are 2D view specific. All right. So you saw that I did not put in any things for HVAC and I really only put in some of the lighting, I didn't put in anything that related to fire safety or whatever. So if I was going to hand this off to someone that was more of an expert in that field and allow them to do all the placement of, let's say, life safety requirements, HVAC, air handling equipment, I could say, hey, here's my spaces, you know, draw in what you need to draw in, and then let me coordinate that with the rest of the drawing when you're done. That'd be fine too. But in terms of a ceiling plan, we've got a legend We've got symbols and locations, generally where we want things to be. And so as far as I'm concerned, I think that's good enough for now. 
All right, exterior elevations. Let's get into that. Now, it's a lot nicer if the below grade items show up in dashed lines. And there's a couple of ways we can approach this. Uh, I will show you real quick my East presentation, a view filter that we can do if we are in a mode that is in, uh, so here, if I double click in, we're in a mode that is consistent colors, shaded or hidden line, this will work. But as soon as we start introducing textures, this becomes a little bit more problematic. So I like doing something like consistent colors for this. Now, with this to work properly, we would have to go into the view template and under filter, override filters, edit. You can do dash lines as the pattern, color black, no override, projection surface, background, solid white, nothing here on the uh, pattern. And then cut poche. Here's my south. Take that on, line it up. And with the south, I need to change that to North Arrows are just needed in top down views, right? So the label of the view should explain what side of the building we're looking at. So north elevation, south elevation. Here I have it say presentation, but actually I should change that view name to north elevation in the properties. Now other things I want in my elevations. So I won't be making the uh, east-west sheets because north-south, same thing for east-west then. But what I want to make sure is that I have everything drawn out. Section lines are still being shown. The column lines are still being shown. Finish lines of floor to floor heights. All right, these are all good. Um, if you have any elevations that you use just for working, make sure you hide those, but these are all important. So that's fine. We could tag the windows and doors again. So if we go into the view, we can go to annotates and say tag all doors, windows, apply. That's easy, right? And then we can do the same in the other view. Sometimes people like drawing on with detail line the wide line, the ground plane. And so in this case, it's like right here. And maybe this patio, just hide it. Let's go in the view, we'll just use some text. I'm just call out some different materials. In the rendering, I have a wrap that's on all the glazing, like kind of a screening. And so I want to note that here. If I had caps off, I could just click uh, into it, and then there's a little all caps. And that moves everything to all caps. So if you're trying to stay consistent and you forgot about it, that's a nice, nice little feature. You would do the same thing for east and west elevations. Let's go to building section. So for building section, different building sections, right? You'll have one that goes through lengthwise of your building, the longitudinal section. You have another one that goes uh, across your building, the traverse uh, building section. And you'll see here we have the transverse building section. We don't have the longitudinal building sec section shown. I want to do that view section, cut right through. And then you usually want to show the more interesting side. However, also want to show, being the purpose of this, is how these different systems connect together. So cutting through where the stairs are also kind of makes sense because you're showing how you circulate the building 
as well. So there's pros and cons to different ways to approach this. I could do this little zigzag here that allows me to break the line. So that way it doesn't muddy up my drawing too much. So if I click on this and I little zigzag, it doesn't do anything to my actual section view. It just breaks it up in the drawing. So I don't have all these extra lines coming through my entire drawing. All right, let's go to those views. With section two, we're gonna focus on this one. Now what I did here is I made a template for this view, architectural section, basically made it so shadows are on, depth queuing, um, it shows the depth, and the model, it in line, wide line silhouette, on the model, all the cut is post shade. That's basically it. So that is how we get this um, kind of main graphic. From here, let's go and crop it nice and tight, which it is. Then we can go and drag this into the sheet. So let's go get that new sheet open. So building sections. We'll go and drag in that building section. I could call it north south. Or if I didn't know my north, south, east, west, I could call it transverse building section. That will show that it's cutting across the length of the building instead of parallel to it, which would be longitudinal. In this case, east, west is my longitudinal section. North, south is my transverse section. And then what I did on this building section is I created a call out to focus on this area for more of a detail to be created about the roof. Let's see, what else do we want to show here? Well, this comes in a little bit later in the drawing series, so about phase three, after you've developed your structure a little bit more. So this is closer to design development when we'd start throwing in these, uh, these section views onto our sheets. And we want to push out the cuts, show the elevation lines from floor to floor heights. And once again, if you want to, if it says 2D, you can go and make that not extend as far. That would be fine. Column center lines you want to show in these views. You want to show referring views as well. You can do a little break on those and make it not so uh, prominent. A low grade, you can do dash lines. Okay, a couple things to make sure that you do for your template as well to make sure you see these hidden lines. Remember, we had set the parameter, created a new parameter, and we made it so we can use uh, below grade as an option. Then on the template, under architectural section here in this case, but you would do the same for your elevations, is make sure when you do your model display for edit. In my section, I accidentally had uh, silhouettes as wide lines. Uh, just choose none. And then that way, when you say OK, apply and OK, you'll see your dashed lines come in here for anything that has the below grade parameter. Otherwise, silhouettes overrides the view filter so it ends up tracing uh, edges onto those items. All right, now that I have that, I noticed one key thing that's missing here. Uh, below these structures, I need to have definitely some sort of foundation there. So I'm gonna go and add that in and make sure that this all looks correct. So I'll do that in 3D. So here we want to just note out anything that uh, maybe is a little atypical. And we can label the rooms here. So we can throw in some text. We can label the rooms that we're seeing. So if we go to our finished floor, go to view, 
We could do a view template on this. You can see how it shows all the circulation, which is nice, our elevator. Right? So it's it's a cool section right now. I think we're best off focusing on just one. So get out of this one. We do have a, here we go, a wall section to go to, go to view. So in this wall section, there's where we have our detail for this spot here. We'll throw this wall section on our building section page as well. Okay, so I cleaned up the names a little bit more on these different sections and uh, details here in my project browser just to make it a little bit easier to navigate. I'm going to collapse the working drawings because everything should be under my O1 Arc folder. So now from here, if I go in, I'm going to go and move this over. I'm going to include a wall section here. And I'm just going to change the name then instead of building sections, I can just change the name to sections. I'm not going to do much with this wall section here. It's really just kind of describing where this call out's coming from. Right, this page is done. If I want to make another section page, I can. What I could do is go to uh, double right click on this and say duplicate sheet with detailing that'll include the graphic scale. And then here I can drag in that other section, the east west building section, if we'd like. It's rather large. So the crop box here, you have our little zigzags on it. And we can go and crop some of the building out if we wanted to show it at this scale. So you could do that. That's a little trick for you. There's the slider. Oh, what did I do here? I need to go back to my ceiling plan and make sure I have the name on the sheet correct. Cool, so I was just going to label all these rooms. So I'm going to do that. From here, what we could do is label out anything additional. Things that are very typical would be like these crazy arches here. We could call those out if we wanted to. But I'm going to just keep this drawing. This one here a little more simple since we spent the time on this one here. Okay, so now we're going into wall sections. So we can develop this a little bit more if we'd like to. Now with this wall section, purpose is to manage the structure and its composition. So let's go and uh, unpoche this here. So if we go to VG on this, all cut patterns, we're just going to clear overrides. And we could also start to call out these details if we'd like to and how they interact with each other. Clean this up a little bit by um, going to view, cut profile, and we want to edit this one based on this. And we want to flip there. I ended up joining these two, but did view cut profile on these two. So now I've got concrete rigid insulation. This should be layers of sand and gravel. But a uh, type edit structure. Here's the gravel. Why are we not seeing this pattern? This hatching pattern. Should be showing. Fine detail. Yeah, so that beats me. But anyways, that's the idea there. This floor, this patio here, we can bring it in a little bit more if we'd like to. We also can show like rigid insulation in here. So we can go to annotate and add that in as a filled region and say there's going to be rigid insulation basically right here. This little guy up here, I recognize this is not correct. We would want, we would want our uh, roof and everything to extend over and beyond a little bit or do some kind of cap or flashing here. Make sure our graphic scale is still good, which it is, quarter here. Now, typically a wall section might be a little bit larger, but that's okay. We're just throwing it in on this page uh, to just hyper-focus on a couple little things. If I go to annotate aligned, 
we can just string some dimensions up there. We can dimension out thicknesses or label the kinds of walls that we have going on here. Let's just go and add a little bit of annotation here. Cool, so that kind of la labels all the uh, main assemblies and some heights. And then from there, you get into those details. So that gets us close. All right, let's save that. Okay, so I have a couple quick edits to make, so bear with me. I'm gonna go here and um, this is slab on grade with a terrazzo finish. So let me just note that. I'll just edit this with uh, detail. If I go up to annotate, we can do a masking region and I'm just going to sketch out uh, some sort of like capping here. Okay, so now this detail finally finally looks uh looks good. Looks a lot better. A couple other things to update real quick. Here I had footing on here. I should really just say foundation. Then the roof plan, I should just note what these are. Okay, so let's look into making an enlarged plan as well as an interior elevation from that plan. So right off the bat, I had created a call out on my first floor plan here. And then what I'm doing here is going to this view. So that's my enlarged plan. I'm dragging it into my sheet that's the A400 series. In that, I do wanna show my column lines. I do want to show uh, potentially then like what rooms those are. So since they were already tagged as rooms under the annotate, you can just go to uh, tag room, room tag, and just drop in your tags for those spaces. And then I will show you how I did this uh, chain of dimensions. So basically from here, I'm just going from finish face on all of the dimensions here. So I'm just trying to stay consistent with all my dimension strings. So do that, I want annotate, aligned, and I'm just hitting tab until I get the surface that I want. Actually that, grab the column. So I just wanna be careful on what's highlighting in blue before I click. And we place it somewhere that's not too messy. All right, so now that's looking good. So I did a string there, string there, and string there. And I could annotate at this point any other details that I want to do to point out anything that's atypical or that's really important. I want to adjust the north arrow and graphic scale as needed. So coming out of the view, this one's three quarter for this uh, enlarged plan. I could tag the doors and note the doors again if uh, we think that's valuable. And then from here, I could be calling out the kind of furniture that we want, you know, the vendor or whatever. I don't have that information, but you can call it all that kind of stuff too. And let's go and create our uh, interior elevation. View, elevation, elevation, interior elevation. And I'm just gonna bring this over until it grabs right there. And then we can check more if we wanna create like all four from this spot, that would be fine. I'm just gonna right click and uh, 
go to the view, go to elevation view, and in our browser, interior elevation, let's see, what's our properties? View identity, let's put in 01 arc. So building elevations, interior elevation. There we go. So there's where we are. And here we could call it, um, you know, office. And we're looking west. I want to get cropped up pretty close to the floor. And if this is in our way, we could hide anything that really shouldn't be shown. This is a little halfway wall here, three feet tall. So if we don't like it at three feet, maybe we should make this five feet. Yeah, there we go. And then there's our door. And then our ceiling is like right up here. Cool. Now I think we can get all four kind of just drop down here. Let's just go and check those off. On those interior elevations, you can refine them as needed. You might annotate manufacturer's recommended mounting heights for fixtures and equipment. Any other miscellaneous notes, material hatching. So, for example, what kind of paint finish we have. Sherwin-Williams, Glacier White. And in your specifications, you can talk about like the sheen and the application or whatever. Just kind of say like, you know, all the walls here are getting Sherwin-Williams. Glacier white. In each view, you can go and annotate your finishes, finished materials, and what have you. Um, and coming in, you know, I, I might even want to think about just doing a little poche on all the cuts. All right, so I made my scale match. This is the three ace. Here I have a north arrow because it's a plan view. That matches three quarters for the scale of this. There's my interior elevation marker. Now the numbering on these, you know, probably north should be one D. Okay, so now we got A, B, C, D. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into my details. So for our details in phase one, you wanna create some kind of preliminary idea of what your wall thicknesses, floor, roof thicknesses might be based on a typical composition of those elements. So you have some idea of what's been used in the past, what you're thinking. Once you do that, you can start drawing out your plans. Phase two, you want to add in additional preliminary detail drawings and detail sheets or create a detailed book, interior wall, partitions, plumbing walls, any other type of wall, maybe even exterior that is going to be used throughout to create the style that you want. Now, phase three, phase four, you fully develop your details. So that's in design development, construction drawings. That's one. That's my roof. Here's my wall. And let's see, that's one half inch equals a foot, one half inch equals a foot. So these are rather large. They could be even like three quarter. But I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm going to go into here. We have half inch aluminum cladding panels. We have furring strips, rigid insulation, vapor barrier, cross laminated timber panel, vertical furring strips, gypsum paint finish. This is my typical exterior wall. So 
So I want to show you where that came from again, and I'll show you how I made this. So if we go into a uh, floor plan, let's start there. Here you can see that we had some sections being created. So we have like this wall section here. This call out is coming from this section right here. A typical exterior wall assembly. Going into the detail view, this one I did just straight up. So I have all the layers basically made in the edit type properties, structure edit. They're all laid out here. You can take a screenshot if you'd like. I have my finish material, my thicknesses. I've got it all laid out right here from the outside to the inside. The metal furring and gypsum, you can even double up on the gypsum. Uh, you want to insert another. Finish one. I have two layers of fire protection here. And then with the vertical furring strips, I basically am just creating a cavity to run uh, electrical pipe through. I can make those furring strips as thick as I want, really. So that way I can uh, create like a chase for plumbing if I need to. The seven inch cross laminated timber panel is right here in the middle. If I'd like to, I could draw some detail lines to show like kind of the layering of that. And then we have a vapor barrier. And so that vapor barrier, since I modified the thickness, I have to bump that over really quick. That vapor barrier is just applied to the outside face of the cross laminated timber panel. And then I have rigid insulation and you would go to whatever thickness you need for your R value on that. And then I have vertical furring strips attached to the outside of that to create more of a rain screen uh, for the cladding so that way this can breathe. And then I have half inch uh, thick aluminum cladding panels attached to the furring strips. Now, if the furring strips are going to be located outside the rigid insulation, you do need fasteners long enough to uh, go into the cross laminated timber panel, which is the structural part of this wall composition. If your cladding is too heavy, you might need to do it a slightly different way. Have your furring strips attached directly to the panel and just infill your insulation in between the furring strips. Then you can have shorter fasteners to allow for a heavier cladding going straight into the furring strips. So you kind of have to figure out what your uh, cladding weighs and talk to someone that knows structures very well and they can tell you what types of fasteners you need to use or if you have to assemble things slightly different. But overall, the concept's the same. Now to put these brake lines in, that's just a component, a brake line component that you can load in. And so I have one on the top and the bottom. Other than that, this is just a detail line. And so I just made a custom line by going to manage and going to settings, line styles, and making a new one, call it whatever you want, and then you can change the color and the pattern. Then you go to annotate detail line, and then now here's the list of lines that you have that you can use. So I use the dash line for that, with the hatching and the thicknesses and all that based on the walls composition under edit, edit structure. That's the wall. The wall's the easier part. Let's go into the roof with the screening detail. So the roof, I have a section. Let's back out and once again look at where this came from again. So if we go to 301 sections, here you see that the roof section is coming from this call out right here. And so this is calling out the arch, this tapered arch and our roof deck, and then this screening that's on top. Timber screening being called out, so that's that family. The roofing panels I have drawn with a detail line. And in this case, I hid, so if I hit the light ball, I actually hid the 3D model of it. I just kind of used it as a target on where I needed some lines to start. So you can kind of see that right here. And then from there, it, the roof kind of curves and everything, so it kind of just throws everything off. So I hit it, and then from there, I just made sure that my thicknesses were correct and my base target was pretty much correct. So I have metal roofing panels, and these metal roofing panels are going to have a, a rib to them. So here's an example of what I was talking about. Here's a standing seam metal roofing panel. They've got ones with like reverse profiles even, but this is pretty standard. So 
we're going to uh, kind of recreate that here from a side view. So there's going to be some hidden lines involved. So there's the top of the panel, which is selected, the bottom of the panel line, just a thin line here. And then this would be kind of where the bend goes up and down and up and down. And so that's uh, a hidden line right there. Once we get past that, metal furring. So this metal furring, so from here to here is a metal furring that's going to be attached through an EPDM membrane that's going to be rolled onto some plywood, which I actually forgot to note. So let me go and note that right now. So we would use like structural plywood for that. And then this way we can attach the plywood through all the rigid insulation into the cross laminated timber. And then that way our metal roofing fasteners don't need to go all the way through all of this rigid insulation. Uh, three layers here of two inch rigid insulation with staggered seams. So I just drew that up. Uh, I, I did rigid insulation components. So if you go to annotate, you can go to component detail component. And here you can load in rigid insulation sections. And then what I did there was I just drew some detail lines to show the staggered seams. Then another detail line for another vapor barrier. And then we have our structural decking, cross laminated timber. And so that's done with one detail line that's a wide line. And then I made sure to go up an inch and a half by just doing pick lines offset. So if I go to annotate detail line, I can choose a thin line with pick lines and do an offset of 1.5 inches, which is about the layer of each lamination. And I could just keep doing lines like that. So anyways, I did that, the correct number going up. So that's one, two, three, four layers at an inch and a half thick, which equates to six inches. And then underneath that, the cross laminated timber decking is attached to the tapered heavy timber arch. And so that's another thing that I hid in the view. I hid the arch and I used the lines on the arch to then verify how deep that need to be. Now this arch that we're seeing, you see multiple lines there. That's because there's quite a few arches kind of down the down the line here. And so I just picked the first edge and it's if you remember these arches are kind of twisting. And so that creates a little bit of a confusing look to it. So this cleans it up a little bit to be more simplified. By just hiding that and then using a detail line with wide lines to create that. So this then creates I think a pretty good looking um, detail for the roof. Now these uh, screened panels, right? There's there's no detail yet shown in 3D on how these are going to attach to the actual roof itself. So what I did here is I drew a group. Uh, so basically these are a bunch of detail lines. And then I highlighted and then I clicked on create group and that grouped these in. And if I ever need to edit them, I can go and edit the group by double clicking in and changing things. So I threw in basically just some detail lines here to create a plate and a standoff bracket. And then I used hidden lines for detail lines to create basically where the base, like a base plate for these uh, standoff brackets to be. And this I'm going to draw in fasteners here. So I'll do that real quick. One, one way is, yeah, it's fasteners that go all the way through Second way is, you know, this goes all the way down and through, and then you have to kind of notch everything else around it. I'm thinking maybe fasteners would be faster and easier. And then I also did the same thing up here, but to do these bolts nice and neat, I actually did throw in the component for the bolt, and then I just de I did a detail line, pick line, and I just traced the bolt with that, and I made these hidden lines, dash lines, and these solid to show that these are actually embedded into the timber. All right, so let's take a look at how I did that. So if I go to annotate and I go to component, here I can load in like a bolt, right? So I have some already loaded in. And I want a bolt side. Let's just do five ace. I hit space bar. Oops. I'm gonna flip it. And here's where I just basically placed it. And then if you go to annotate detail line and do pick lines, then now you can just trace the lines that you want. Here I just did the shaft and I made the shaft lines just hidden lines. I'm gonna undo that. But what I do want to do is show some bolts coming down here. So I'm gonna go back to components, 
Now, I don't know if I have any kind of lag screws. I do. And so I'm going to do five ace again. And I'm going to spin that around. And we'll place one here. Place one there. I need to drag that. This one, we'll just delete and copy this one now that we have it. Now we can delete that bolt. And then let's go and we can keep this one just like that because it's not bothering anything. But let's go and um, get this. And we'll copy it into the other one. So I think that's all of it. Control C to copy. Go into this detail. I made these two different because the heights were slightly different. And highlight all that. I might want to make this into its own little group, but I don't think I can. Okay, so now we have that done. So this looks good to me. Got these lags going through, got bolts going through. And maybe these are like, uh, like threaded into some sort of threaded inlet. All right, so you got to see how I, little hack I did for that. That's feeling good. All right, so in here, I think there was some sort of like override. In this, yeah, there's some sort of override I have on this. I just have to reset that. There we go. There's my hatching pattern. And I might even half tone that. My graphics in view by elements. Half tone. Insulation, just to tone it down a notch. That looks good. Okay, I like how those are looking. I feel like in this detail, it, nothing's really actually touching that. So I'm going to hide that in view. And for the actual location of this, right, you can see that in the section. And we get a sense of where that level three already is with it. And it's not critical to the detail. So I think it's best leaving that out. Uh, one and a half inches equals a foot. I think I already updated this. Yep. So that is it for details. I'm going to save that. So you saw two totally different techniques there. You saw one technique where I basically kept the composition of the layers of the structure I had already drawn and just add a couple little lines on top for like the membrane. Actually, one line on top. And then uh, two section lines. And then this one, two section lines. But then I hid everything else except for these uh, wood timber screening blocks. For the annotations, I just make one and I copy it down. It keeps everything lined up nicely. So in my template, I have uh, some schedules kind of ready to go. So that's what you see here. Door schedule, I do count, family type, with height, type mark. Window schedule, you'll see like all basically the windows I have in here right now are curtain walls. Room schedule, so this you can go and like total up the square footage if you'd like. And then I have a keynote, generic keynote one here, and you can use that with a note block schedule. A note block, right? You can throw down some keynotes and you can then use this as like a text note. It's kind of a custom schedule. I think I've used those before with like grab bars for bathroom or something like electrical outlets, anything you might not be able to get a nice schedule out of if you want to deal with parameters and trying to infuse that into a schedule, you can always like manually tag things and it's a dumb schedule you know it's not smart it doesn't update automatically but it could be one way to approach something if, if it saves you time if it's for something little all right so if we go and let's just inspect one of these schedules so you can get a sense of it and we double click on it we can edit the fields here create a new schedule by going to annotate i believe it was anyways it's a room schedule i've thrown over the different parameters that I want in the schedule. Once I have that, then I can go to filter if I want to filter things out. Sorting grouping, sorting by level, the number, 
I do my every instance. If I want grand totals, I can check that. And I can say totals only. Formatting, appearance. Okay. Now I have a total. So then now on my schedules, I have a total square footage. And this, once again, is just for floor one here, right? So that's the room number, the name, and the floor. So obviously, I, as I add in my other floors, I'll be adding up square footage. Um, phase one, phase two, you probably won't have schedules. Phase three, you would uh, check the type of instant properties you would uh, name uh, instance properties. So basically, like each item, you would just want to check the properties. You might need to add additional parameters because these instant properties, instance properties, and type properties are what populate these schedules. So, for example, I'd click on the doors. I'd want to double check like what my uh, type mark is, if that's correct. So it's filling in the schedule correctly, what the naming on it is, make sure all that data comes in correctly. I'd also want to check the formatting and titles of the schedules so that way they're all consistent. So that's what you saw when I came in here and was looking at the formatting here. You know, you can change the uh, appearance of it as well. You know, certain font type and size and all that good stuff. Check the spelling, check the spacing. Usually your schedules are going to grow. So if you ever want to do a legend, I have a video on that. But you can just go up to legends, go to legend, and then you can create your own legend. Here I can go and say like door and we'll do it at a uh, quarter might be fine. So we'll do that. Say, okay. And then we go over to annotate components, legend component. All right, but I have a, a deeper video in this if you want to check it out. Then that's pretty much it. Uh, I, I want to show you on the cover page then how we can get rid of any drawings that we don't want. The cover, I have a list drawing index. I don't want to see uh, 900 3D drawings. So if I go to 700, see how there's an X there? That's going to exclude it. So I made it where anytime you have an X, it'll exclude it. So if I change this to 90X, then you'll see on the cover, it's no longer there. So let's see, I have my site plans, floor plans, roof plan, floor one ceiling plan. So these are the ones I developed in this video. So that is good to go. And this is all done. We're going to wrap this thing up. So I'm going to export all my PDFs and then have fun making your construction drawings. Don't forget, if you want the guide that I used to make these drawings, it's available for download on my website, studiohero.co. Make sure to save, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.